Today I'm joined by Graham Boyd, who has been described as a rare combination of both conceptual genius and dynamic, practical, get it done executive. Um, welcome to the show, Graham. Thank you very much, Neil. It is a pleasure to be with you on the show. There are a couple of streams that have flowed together to where I am now. One of them was growing up in apartheid South Africa, a governance system for a country where people were separated from each other and most of the population was separated from the right to vote and any real share in the wealth generated by the country. I studied particle physics at university and worked in particle physics research for the first for my first career of 10 years. Then I became a manager with Procter & Gamble and worked in management in P&G for another 11 years. Those two journeys took me from South Africa to Germany, Italy, Japan, Belgium, China, and back to Belgium. So a lot of traveling. And to, during the mid 2000s the the climate emergency was becoming more and more apparent the things that when i was at university as a physics student i'd expected would happen either deep into my retirement or long after i was starting to see these things happening now and that was the point where i said okay we have to do something, we have to do something quickly. What can I do integrating everything that I've worked on to figure out what are some of the root causes behind what we're seeing? And the conclusion, one of the conclusions I came to, which led to the Fair Shares Commons company, is that by incorporating companies as property and incorporating them as companies where most of the stakeholders are separated from the company. Only the investors have the right to vote in a general meeting and the lion's share of the wealth generated is one of the root causes of many of the issues we're having in the same way that the apartheid context in South Africa was a deep underlying root cause of many of the problems that South Africa wrestled with. And so I came to the conclusion 10 years ago that if we're going to actually make progress with all of the things that we're working on, and all of the superb initiatives out there, like you know, values-based leadership, et cetera, et cetera, we have to also reinvent how we incorporate. That was a big step forwards, and the final bit that came in, and it took me to the point of, no, this, what we now call the fair shares commons, is, to recognize that in today's world, the problem we're wrestling with today, the scarcest capital we have is human capital, in particular human attention and human relationships and trust. And in particular, the capacity for people to come together and innovate across highly complex global problems, which requires very, very high levels of trust. And that led me to think that it may well be a good idea to think of the company no longer as property, no longer as something that separates most of the stakeholders from the company, but as a, a commons a commons of the productive capacity and the innovative capacity of the company. And for that to work, that means that all of the different stakeholders 
need to be engaged in the governance of the company. They need to have a fair share of the wealth generated by the company. And this then opens up a whole swathe of completely new ways of solving the problems that the world is facing. Yeah, there's something really interesting about the the concept I think that you're describing here, which is very much around co-creation of, of everything. I'm, I'm hearing this this phrase co-creation um, from a whole variety of different sources, um, and I think it's really becoming almost like the emerging way that um, strategy is being evolved and developed, not only in larger organisations, but certainly in, in small kind of startups and um, sort of entrepreneurial um, ventures as well. We're seeing this kind of co-creation and collaboration being at the heart of you know very fast moving and sort of organizations that are very fleet of foot do, do you see this as being almost like the new innovation not only in terms of how people work together but how organizations you know beyond nonprofits and ngos but you know commercial organizations can can really adapt to these these flourishing and changing times it feels like it's a very opportune moment yes i believe it is if you look at the challenges that we're facing in the world, they are all global scale. They have deeply, deeply lying interconnectedness in such a way that it's, it's impossible to do the old style of this is the problem, let's solve it. We're now in a world where to address our global challenges, we need to do lots of little attempts and work our way through how can we transform something that is inherently nebulous that cannot be pinned down and analyzed in a finite amount of time because there are just too many variables changing way too quickly and that are interconnected in ways that we cannot know about until long after the fact. And to address something like that, you can't do the kind of centralized approach where a one or more brilliant people understand the problem and then solve it. It has to be done in a deeply collaborative way across everybody who has any contact with the problem that we're solving and it is simultaneously bottom up and top down it is that it's that dynamic isn't it that's really really interesting because what i'm seeing certainly with my work with the um, the mindful collective and some of the partners and, and organizations that we're talking to there one of the, one of the key sort of core concepts at the heart of that is to try and establish if it doesn't already exist or if it does exist to to really build upon it this this idea of having a common purpose and actually everything in terms of decision making strategy day-to-day -day stuff always feeding back to a common purpose and i think what you're describing is something that has purpose and sort of joint motivation inspiration and drive collaboratively but being a, there's a real consistency there isn't there because just the very nature of your model is it is driven by a, a shared purpose yes it's very much the combination of absolutely a shared purpose uh, I actually think even more behind purpose is always some context and a need within that context and so it's a shared understanding of where this purpose is coming from, what is the context and need, so that as that purpose changes, you're mindful in the present of the changing context and need, and so your purpose becomes dynamic rather than static. It's always in context and never at risk of becoming ossified and still guiding people's activities long past its sell-by date. And linked to that, you know, to purpose connects with results through action. And 
the action that delivers results comes at the end of the day, no matter how much IT you have, etc. it always comes from human energy. And so the connection between purpose and results is everything that enables human beings to convert their energy into useful results. And at the very heart of that is how effectively we ourselves are able to deal with our own energy. Um, and actually, I will put up something that may be helpful here. So at the very heart of it, the foundation at level one is how do we work with our own individual inattentions? that rob us of our energy. And the more we can develop ourselves in that space, the more of our internal energy we have available to put into useful work rather than internal wrestling matches between our individual angels and devils. The next level is tension between us as human beings. And the better that we have agreed ways of talking to each other when things are getting really tense and filled with friction, so that we're not depending on our own capacity to hold that tension in dialogue, but we have already agreed dialogue scaffolding that we both trust and that holds us up in those situations the more we can convert the energy we have together as a team into useful, productive energy. And then you have the tension between our roles and our tasks. And again, the more we use modern approaches like sociocracy or holacracy to harness those tensions and convert them into organizational integrity, the more energy we have and the more efficiently we convert her human energy into results. And the fair shares common sits up there. That's about harnessing the tension between different stakeholder groups so that all of their energy is maximally and most efficiently converted into results for the business rather than dissipating through lawyers and lots of money and courts into antagonism between the different stakeholders. Let's bring them into the tent working together rather than, um, as one of the US presidents once said when asked, why on earth did you bring him into your cabinet? And the reply was, well, I would rather have him inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. And this is part of what is holding us back in today's world. We have tensions at all four strata here that are at best, most of the time, very poorly managed, let alone harnessed as the resource they are for business growth and productivity. And so my point is that by harnessing all of these, you can convert far more energy into results. And that's what we need to be able to create local regenerative ecosystems and ecosystems of regenerative ecosystems. Is there by implication a certain type of, um, I guess you could call them sponsor or maybe kind of business leader who, who's going to really be bringing this kind of concept into an organization? I mean, obviously this, this kind of thing um, exists and has existed, I guess, for some time in, in nonprofits and NGOs. Um, if we would think about a, a commercial organization, for example, who suddenly hears this and thinks, okay, we have a new normal, we're all emerging from the current situation, we're going to need to adapt, we're going to need to innovate, we're going to need to you know, maximize the opportunity that's presented to us. Is there a certain type of individual who you've seen um, that would embrace this more readily than others? Because I can imagine certain types of companies and organizations sort of folding their arms and saying, we're not going to give away anything. You know, we, we own this. This is ours. 
and of course they're at the other end of the spectrum. So what's a typical persona of somebody who's, who's going to be embracing this kind of thing? I'll start by giving you two historic examples. The first one is a company that probably everybody watching this knows and may well have their brand in their wallet, the Visa Corporation. When the Visa Corporation was first incorporated with D. Hock as the first president uh, and the, the catalyst for what Visa was at first incorporation, they were very, very close to being a fair shares commons. The first incorporation was v of Visa was as a company that could not be bought or sold. It was in many senses a membership commons that s enabled, because it was a membership commons, it enabled all of the different US banks that were growing a credit card business and where all of the banks were hemorrhaging money because they couldn't get it to work as one bank in competition with the other banks. It enabled them to come into collaboration in a way that created the credit card uh, as a platform for working whilst still giving all of the freedom that each individual bank needed to compete. So for me, the Visa is a superb example of how by incorporating as a fair shares commons, you actually get exactly what you need to be phenomenally successful in a business context where collaboration is the necessary route or strategy to success. Another example from the finance sector, at level one and two, you know, internal development of yourself and development of the integrity in your relationship with your colleagues. There is a company called Bridgewater, which is the world's largest hedge fund. Bridgewater's internal operating uh, approach at, is very much centered on levels one and two, really surfacing tensions immediately and harnessing them as a resource for the company to succeed. And Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater, has written an excellent book on how Bridgewater operates and his principles. And that is a, both Ray Dalio's book here and D. Hock's book there have been of inspiration to me over the past decade as I've been working on this. So those give you two examples of success stories over the past decades of very large, very successful companies who have done this level well and that level well. And there are now you know, growing companies that are integrating one or more of these levels. So in that sense, the kind of founder or CEO that will get this is typically one who already has experience in one of these four levels, who has through experience recognized that, for example, if you do this level really well as a developmental organization, there are some things that the developmental approaches for organization design don't touch that require a sociocracy or an holacracy to touch. And there are things that that doesn't touch that require this or that require a legal incorporation. So it's really the kind of CEO or founder who has recognized that the interaction between people is fundamental to their success, that it's not an either compete or collaborate. It's not about either business or nonprofit. It's about how do we integrate the power that each brings into one in such a way that all of the power 
can turn into addressing the global problems we have, creating a world that we all want to live in. And that the, the heart of that, again, is, is the individual human being, that human beings are not cogs in a machine that you can simply exchange in and out as you wish. You know, individual human beings are fully alive each of us with our own individual uniquenesses and it requires far more than just putting people together into a hierarchical organization design to enable all of these living beings to bring everything that their individual uniqueness can contribute in such a way that the organization as a whole is the biggest and most powerful common oneness rather than the lowest common denominator of what survives after all of the tensions have eaten up most of people's available energy and willpower. All of these kind of almost like solo innovators, I can imagine listening to something like this and thinking, wow, what I could do very quickly is to tap into, um, as you say, you know, the, these innate skills and um, sort of offerings, if you like, from, from you know, very, very empowered and, and successful others who collaboratively could really help an ecopreneur or a solopreneur to create a scaled business almost at the click of a switch. Because if you can create a, an environment like this, Surely you can scale something if you have this amazing idea that you're looking to bring to market. Using a framework like this, you can scale so much more quickly than building a very sort of traditional, as you say, hierarchical structure within a business. This feels like it's a very fast track process if you get it right. Absolutely. In, in so many ways, this is an invention and innovation production line. In, in the sense of crowd, just as crowdfunding or crowd investing has enabled everybody to get involved in investing, this very much mobilizes a crowd approach to business. In particular, the, one of the key things about the Fair Shares Commons is that because all of the stakeholders are involved in a share of the wealth generated and the governance rights to steer the company into the future, Fair Shares Commons companies naturally form deep ecosystems. They will collaborate for the overall success of the ecosystem as a whole because all of them benefit from the share of resources within the ecosystem. It's much like nature. Nature works because it has three things. It has common building blocks across all of nature, DNA and RNA. It has common metabolic pathways across all of nature, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And it's not just throw those two together, it's then the third thing is life emerges something unpredictable from just adding the building blocks and the metabolic pathways together, namely sentient life comes out. So what these four levels enable are deep ecosystems of companies. And within a deep ecosystem of companies, you can very easily have a solopreneur come up with an idea take it to whatever point she wants to take it to. And at that point, other parts of the ecosystem will come in and collaborate with her. And there's a deep trust to do that because even if she doesn't become the founding CEO of the startup, but stays in her solopreneur role, the founding team that does pick this up is still part of the ecosystem, is still sharing wealth within the ecosystem as a whole, not just giving all the wealth to the investors. Um, of course, the investors must have a fair share of the wealth. That's central to it. And the, the founding idea generator, the solopreneur, can choose flexibly 
how close or distant she remains with the startup as it grows. She may say, right, I now want to move on to the next big idea. You guys take it and run. I no longer want to be involved. I just want my share of the wealth generated all the way through to this is my baby for the rest of my life and I remain in there. The opportunities here are almost boundless, aren't they? And it's just really a case, I think, of people sort of understanding the model, the framework, and almost seeing how they can use that as a, as a, a concept to imagine maybe the old style of, of business that they might otherwise have, have shaped up. I know you've written a book around this topic, and um, tell us a little bit more about how that came about and um, how people can get hold of a copy, because I'm sure a lot of people listening to this are going to be thinking, hmm, there's going to be something in this for me. The book is still in the very late stage draft. What, it's, what we're waiting for now is a sub-editor to take a final pass through the book and polish every sentence and take about 50 pages out of the book, making it really easy to read. The book is already available for download as a PDF or to pre-order the paperback and hard copy. Um, and you can track it down by Googling the current working title. The, how the book came about is fascinating. I was at a conference in London about five years ago on rethinking economics, the global movement to really rethink economics education and economics as a discipline. And I asked one of the speakers who is a US pluralist economics professor, a question around what is the impact in the economics profession of what I was previously showing, the level one developmental stage. You know, where are economists in terms of their stage of development, their stage of meaning making and their capacity for transformational thinking, post-rational thinking? And that question then led the two of us to get into conversation for the rest of the conference day through until late at night over dinner we basically both bunked the rest of the talks. And the outcome of our conversation was the recognition that he was deeply interested in what I was doing to create businesses that integrated all four levels in order to lead to regenerative businesses and regenerative ecosystems. So he was interested in that. And I fully recognize that a big part of what is holding us back is the neoclassical economics paradigm, which is much more a normative paradigm of telling us what the economy should be, rather than the descriptive approach of trying to understand what an economy is and could be. So the two of us then said, no, we, we need to come together and write a book that integrates the full spectrum from at the one end, what could a general theory of the economies look like? Building off Einstein's general relativity as a, an inspiration and a metaphor, uh, all the way through to what needs to be done by every single individual that is involved in, in any sense in work or has any impact on society and the planet, what are the methodologies, the cutting edge of how do we develop our individual capacity to engage with these problems that are highly nebulous, complex, ambiguous, etc. And so that's then what led to this book and the, the red thread running through the book was our realization that this is a problem that was solved or addressed a hundred years ago by people in physics, people like Einstein who developed you know, relativity, heavily involved in quantum mechanics, etc. The lenses that he looked through to look at the world and to recognize what was missing in classical physics, along with the cubists and all of the other 
innovators in art in that era, they were using very similar lenses. And these were lenses that said, in essence, two things. Number one, the reality that we experience or what we see and believe is there is absolutely not the same as what actually is there at that scale. And the, the second thing that they recognized was that we need to work with complementary pairs. Like in physics, it was originally thought that particles and waves were two completely distinct things, and you were either a particle or you were a wave. However, that's not actually how nature is. Nature is something that we can't fully grasp in words with our human size and experiences, but nature at the quantum level truly is something that is simultaneously both wave and particle. And we can't actually really understand what that means because it's not simply saying you put the two together and you know, glue them together at the hips. Nature, an electron is something that when you look at it this way, you see a particle, and when you look at it this way, you see a wave. Both ways of looking are necessary, and neither of them are sufficient to truly grasp what the whole of the electron is, which strangely enough is exactly what Picasso said. You know, if you want to understand and represent on canvas what a horse is, you need to paint it from multiple perspectives on one canvas. Um, you know, he said, you may look at my painting of a horse and not see a horse that looks like the horse you're looking at, but you're sure going to see the essence of horseness. So for those of you who are listening to this rather than actually watching uh, this particular uh, episode, the title of the book that you need to search for is Picasso and Einstein, The Economy, Leadership and You. Uh, if you're watching this, uh, you can see on screen uh, the cover of the book. This is fascinating stuff, Graham. I mean, honestly, the, the, the various kind of angles that you're coming from here, I mean, it's no wonder that this model and this framework and your thinking is... Um, you know, taking a very, very different perspective um, over business and the economy going forward, because to be bringing these kinds of thoughts into the mix and then come out with a framework that is of its nature, you know, holistic and, and very true and very people centric. I mean, it's a, well, it's a fascinating journey that I'm sure for you is going to continue and continue and continue. Absolutely. Very much so. The, you know, the, the next step on this journey we have started up a startup program for startups from day one to begin using all four levels. And I'm now working hard on starting up together with colleagues an investment fund so that we can invest in these startups from day one, get them to the point where they are truly successful so that they can then attract in from a broader range of investors the capital they need without the risk of mission creep or values creep coming in at the point where the first investment comes in. This, this really, really resonates. I, I just love the holistic nature, people-centric nature of the businesses that you're looking to support here. This has been a really, really fascinating talk, Graham. I'm really, really sort of grateful for your time and sharing uh, both the book and the framework. And um, people who uh, are looking to connect with you, um, so it's Graham Boyd PhD on, on Twitter and uh, Graham Boyd PhD on uh, LinkedIn. So thank you again, Graham, for your time today, and I wish you every success with the uh, the new ventures. Only a pleasure, Neil, and thank you very much for your time as well. I have found this conversation to be a joy and a delight.